Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week we are going to be talking about books with memorable food in them. So we'll see if any of these books make you hungry as we talk about them. If we start talking about a book that you're interested in getting your hands on, each time we talk about a different title, it'll appear on the screen and there will be a list of all the different formats that that title is available in. Some of those will be physical formats like hardcover, paperback, um, an audio CD, large print, and those you can request through our online catalog and the website is there on your screen right now. Some of the titles will also say that they are available digitally. And for those, you'll see things like our Overdrive app and Overdrive offers eBooks and audiobooks. And we might see that it's available via Hoopla and Hoopla offers eBooks and downloadable audiobooks and also movies and music and graphic novels. Or it may show that it's available via RB Digital and RB Digital offers downloadable audiobooks and also magazines, week long passes to Acorn TV or a week long pass to the great courses. And the great thing about our Hoopla and RB Digital apps is that there's never a wait for any of the items that are there in the app. You can download them and start watching or reading or listening immediately. So if you think that some of our books sound tasty this week, make sure to get your hands on them using one of those ways. And this week we have with us, there are five of us here this week, and we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. I am Jennifer Granuski. I am the community, my computer stopped for a moment, so I didn't know if I was glitching or could be heard or not. Sorry if I was talking weird. Um, I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our question for this week, since it is food week, was what is the most memorable food or meal that you have ever had? And I thought about this and decided because I still talk about this. Back when I was 19 or 20 during the summer, I volunteered on a kibbutz in Israel. And it was my first time out of the country, first of all, except for going to Canada because we're in Michigan and Canada is right next door. Um, so we took the 11 hour flight from New York City over to Tel Aviv, got off our plane and started driving to the kibbutz that we were going to be staying on. And in the middle of the desert of Israel, there was what looked to me like a roadside shack. And we went in and we got shawarma there. And mm. at this point in my life, I didn't know what shawarma was. I walked in and there were giant racks of meat that they're shavy. And this isn't uncommon now. Now you can go into Middle Eastern restaurants anywhere and this is normal, but I was like, oh, meat. So they shaved it off and then there were these delicious um, homemade pitas and they put like fried potatoes. I'm still not sure what all was in there because they don't make them like this at any of the American restaurants that I've been to. So there are fried potatoes in there with some oil and probably tahini sauce, but I wouldn't have known it was tahini sauce back then. There were vegetables, there was lemon and it was and then the meat and I chose lamb. It was amazing, probably because I had just gotten off a plane from being on there for 11 hours and I was in the middle of an amazing country and experiencing world travel for the first time in my life. But I still remember that and I'm sure I'm annoying to eat Middle Eastern food with because anytime we go and I'm eating shawarma, I'm like, this isn't as good as what I had in Israel in the middle of the desert. So I'm sure people are like, shut up, Jennifer. We all know that you travel, good for you. <laughs> but um, so that's my most memorable meal. So today we also have with us Marsha Langendurfer, the a reference librarian at the Bedford Branch Library. And Marsha, what is your most memorable food or meal that you've eaten? Um, I'm going to give a shout out to my grandmother. Well, probably both of my grandmothers, but my dad's mom, um, they immigrated over from Poland. And so everything she made, like her parents didn't even speak English and everything she made was just amazing and from nothing. And, you know, you knew better than to ask what was in something. <laughs> but um, my most memorable meal that she made was Polish pancakes, which are actually like crepes, but we put syrup on them. And I think I've tried it since and it's just not the same, but I would, my favorite thing about spending the night there was breakfast. So I loved her homemade sausage and casings and the Polish pancakes. So that's what I'm going with. 
This whole, this whole, I don't know if we call these episodes, whatever, this whole episode is going to make me super hungry. I just want everybody <laughs> to know that, like, as soon as we get done, I'm going to be like, oh, I don't know. Any Polish pancakes I could get my hands on? No, <laughs> probably not, but thank you, Marcia. Also with us this week, we have Jody Russ, the community librarian at the Bedford Branch Library. And what is your most memorable food or meal, Jody? Well, I love food, first of all, so I could come up with about a million memorable meals. But the thing when you when I first read that question for this week, I thought um, when I was probably 12, I don't know for sure, but I think I was 12. We went out west. We were staying at Glacier National Park and we went to and mostly we just camped and made our own food. But we went to a fancy restaurant one night that was right along a river in Glacier and the special of the day was fresh rainbow trout that they'd caught in the river. And so I thought, oh, I, you know, this sounds good. I'll try this. I like fish. I e eat all kinds of seafood. You know, we've always, always have. So I ordered this rainbow trout dinner. And again, I'm 12. The thing comes to me and it's the whole fish head <laughs> attached, like, and I screamed. <laughs> <laughs> My mom had to take me, you know, I had to leave. My mom had to have them take it back. I mean, it's kind of like the thing from Christmas Story where they send the duck back because they have to take the head off. But um, yeah, that's definitely, I mean, I can honestly say I don't even remember what the fish tasted like. Um, I think I did eat it afterwards, but uh, yeah, that's definitely the most memorable food thing. <laughs> that's memorable in a different way. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> Traumatizing food experiences. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. Also with us today, we have Kelly Vignier, the community librarian at the South Rockwood Branch Library. And Kelly, what's your most memorable food or meal? Well, I love food. And um, so I have a lot of memorable ones too. And actually, Marsha and I call each other Scooby and Shaggy because we eat so much when we're together and it's amazing. So a lot of my um, like firsthand memories come with Marsha and all the food that we used to eat when we worked together at the same library. <laughs> But um, my most memorable one was um, in high school, we went to Spain, went to northern Spain for um, 10 days and the food there was atrocious. <laughs> and the first, um, well, their um, national dish is like paella and that's the first time we ever had it. And, um, we were in Madrid all day walking around and during the afternoon is when they take their off time, their siestas and, you know, they have their own time. So we found this restaurant off a beaten path and we we're like, let's try the paella. Oh my gosh, it was terrible. There was like chicken claws and like whole shrimp and my mom and my best friend and uh, her grandma, we were just like, what the heck did we get ourselves into? And that kind of set the tone for the rest of the trip. Um, white asparagus soup, not great. Um, we tried so hard to get something that we'd like, so we'd ask for french fries and they were like, you know, just sticks of potatoes, like raw potatoes, because they were like, mm, maybe like it was it was absolutely terrible. So that's my most memorable. <laughs> we all lost a lot of weight and we were extremely hungry when we came home. <laughs> Good you know, times. Yeah, you know what, Shay? I thought, why didn't we give a shout out to the fair food feast that we used to do? Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, kind yeah. Of fair, or deep fried Thursdays. You're right. I, most of my eating memories are with you, Cal. You're right. I know. <laughs> like, there are so many. Like, one of the other ones that I was going to say, too, was the Chicago hot dog that we had. Oh, and yeah. Had the Chicago dog with all the stuff in it and trying to eat it was ridiculous, but it, that was delicious. So that was, I'll give you two food memories. A delicious and a uh, <laughs> yeah. totally overwhelming. <laughs> 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 little bit of food culture shock going on. Yeah. And finally with us this week, we have Mandy Draganik and Mandy is a cataloger in our collections department. And what is your most memorable food or meal, Mandy? So I've, I, I can't ever decide on these questions, but I've come up with, uh, I was visiting my dad in Virginia and they took me to their, um, like their favorite, somewhat local barbecue place. It was kind of an hour away, I think, but it was some of the best barbecue I've ever had in my whole life. Um, but even better than the barbecue were their hush puppies. They were just unbelievable. And we had eaten like all the ones they brought to our table. And my dad said to me, they also have really fantastic um, greens, like collard greens and turnip greens. And I don't like them. I never have, I still don't. He said, come on, they're so good. So I tried them and no, I still don't like them. <laughs> but 
because I was such a sport and I tried him anyway, he got me more hush puppies and they were just the best things ever. And I understand that that place has now closed. It was called the Smoky Pig. There were little tiny pigs all over the place. Um, so they will just, whether they really were or not, they will forever in my memory be the very best hush puppies that the world had to offer. So. <laughs> Great, now I want hush puppies and Chicago hot dogs and fair food and potato pancakes. And shawarma. Yeah. And shawarma, I just I just want it all. Just just give it to me. Possibly not the fish with the head on it, although I do love fish, so just mix it all together. One big banquet just for us. All right, thank you everybody for sharing. And now we're gonna move into our books that we have read that have food in them that was memorable to us. And to get us started, let's have Marcia get us started with her books with memorable food. Um, so I was, I just kind of went with a couple of different things. The first one I picked today was not technically food, um, but it was, it definitely impacted me when I was young. We had read um, How to Eat Fried Worms in school in the classroom and I remember reading that and just holding my breath and kind of cringing. This is a story about a young boy who is dared by his friend to eat a certain amount of worms. I think it's like 15, 10 or 15 worms in a, in a time period in order to win $50. Now, anyone who knows me knows that's exactly something I would have done. So I hear this and I hear this story and I think I could probably do that. I could eat these worms, but it was just very cringeworthy. He's trying to get through it. You're cheering for him. You're not sure if he's going to eat them all. He's trying to put like ketchup on them. And, you know, first he's trying to cut them up or just send them down his gullet. So he has very creative ways to try to win this bet. And I won't give it away, but it's um, it was a very good book, but it definitely stuck with me. And of course, made me want to try to eat a worm to see if I could do it. So that was the first one I picked. And then the second one I picked and I, I switched, I picked I, um, Isis Crawford because I thought that Jen was maybe doing um, Joy and Fluke, but I wanted to just give a shout out to these series that have recipes within the books. Um, I love them because they, like me, their lives revolve, revolve around food. So even though they're trying to solve this murder mystery, you know, they're still baking and cooking and they always include the recipes in the book. Um, they're also cozy, cozy, Agatha Christie like Who Done It series. And I feel like um, that if you really just want a nice cozy read, I had a I had one of those reading recommendations come through the other day that she didn't want anything steamy or bad language. And I, it made me laugh, but I also thought I'm gonna give her a nice cozy recipe book. I read these, I always feel like at the end, I'm trying the recipes, I'm copying them. I think that's a fun, clever write into books. I didn't really give a thought to cookbooks until like Jody mentioned it and other people started giving their books. So I'm also gonna give a shout out to anything Rachel Ray, I love her. Call me. Um, so yeah, <laughs> anything Rachel Ray, I love. Um, I own all of her books. I, I try to emulate and be her. So that's my that's just my honorable mention because I didn't really think of cookbooks. I was thinking fiction. Yeah. Thank you. And How to Eat Fried Worms. I don't know if I ever read the book, but when I started putting this together and saw the book cover, I'm pretty sure my brother read it, which Probably. I feel says something about my brother. As yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember, I would say if you're trying to appeal to boys or even boys and girls, I would say in the school classroom, I'm thinking I was like in fourth grade. I was thinking as my fourth grade teacher who I loved anyway. And I think um, I think the boys really got into this book. And I think that was what, I think that was her secret plan all along. Uh, but it really got to me too. So I, I really liked that one. And I love books with recipes in them. I love those. My mom actually has baked some of the Joanna Fluke ones and we've had the chance to try those out and they're delicious. Excellent, thank you. And let's have Mandy go next and share your books with memorable food. So my first one actually could have doubled for the book that I couldn't put down as well. Uh, it's The Martian by Andy Weir. Um, it really, it really hooked me right away. And I just, I just had to know what happened. I really couldn't put it down. Um, but it's about Mark Watney, he was an astronaut. And in the beginning of the book, his crew is um, leaving after, I think, a six month stay on Mars. And uh, there's a, like a hurricane, and so they have to leave in a hurry. And he gets impaled with some antenna and he like gets thrown away in the wind and his crew is sure that he's dead. So they leave, um, but he wasn't dead. 
he was still very much alive. And he now has to figure out how to survive all by himself on Mars. He learns, it's written sort of like a diary style, which I happen to love. I just, I, I don't know why, I just love that. Um, and so a lot of it is just his thoughts. Um, there is a little bit of language, I should say, but I sort of gave him grace because I can't say that I probably wouldn't swear either if I was left alone on Mars. So um, anyway, he he learns how to grow potatoes. He does some math and he figures out that he does not have enough food to survive very long on his own, let alone for as long as he thinks it might take for someone to come rescue him. So he learns how to grow potatoes and throughout his diary entries, his journal entries, he's talking about these potatoes and how in the beginning nothing's ever tasted better and he's the most amazing botanist because he's the first one to grow potatoes on Mars and as potatoes are the only thing he eats, um, he says things like, it's been seven days since I've had any ketchup. Potatoes are terrible, you know. Um, and so th while the whole novel itself was very, um, very eventful and just very action packed in a super nerdy slow way, um, just the potato theme running throughout was hilarious. And it's part of what if you, if you tend to get bogged down in the numbers, uh, the potatoes brought you back around all the time, so. <clears throat> Um, my other book is The Dorito Effect, and I can't say his name, <laughs> uh, Mark Schatzker. Um, it talks about how we have destroyed food in general, how we have destroyed flavor in natural food. And when I read it, I couldn't help but replay in my mind um, a scene from the movie Over the Hedge. It's a kid's animated movie. And there's a part where this little raccoon is trying to get him to eat these Doritos and they just don't want to eat these Doritos. They were called a different brand name, but uh, he opens the bag and it's just this explosion of nacho cheese. And everybody's like, what was that? And he said, nacho flavoring. Um, and that's what we've done. We have taken nutritious barren food and just crammed it full of artificial flavors and things to fool us into thinking that it tastes good. And in one part he talks about um, he was eating dinner with a family and they bought a chicken from this farmer I think in Montreal maybe somewhere in Canada and um, he looked at it and it was the like puniest most sad looking chicken he'd ever seen but it had the most amazing flavor and it didn't need any seasoning. It didn't need anything but the chicken itself. And just a huge eye-opener um, about what we eat and what we put into our bodies. Yeah, Mandy, I read both of those and I feel the same way about both. I was obsessed with The Martian. Speaking of language, the first line of the book made me laugh. Like I was like, yep, sets the tone. And yeah. it, I found it funny too. I also related to the potatoes because my family were potato farmers. And when we built our house, we hauled in all of this potato dirt, which at first was really like smelled horribly. So people, I would be like, come see my beautiful new home. And then, but like, hold your breath. But for years, for the next three years, we had potatoes growing like in our grass and in our front yard. So I kept relating to this potato growing anywhere, even in Mars and in, you know, in small structures. And the line from the Dorito effect that stuck with me forever is that what we're eating these days is not even food. And I yeah. felt like that is food for thought because, and I'm the, I'm the worst culprit, you know, I only, I love junk. So I feel like, yep, that's me. I could do away with real food, but I do feel like you don't even think of that. You think, oh, this is yummy. But it's, is it food? <laughs> Not really. Right. right. Yep. And I don't remember the title of the book. We read it for book club years and years ago, but it was also about food and particularly the processed food. And I don't remember the exact number, but they were talking about the number of ingredients in a chicken nugget, which, you know, if you're making, you know, even a fried piece of chicken at home, you know, you're, you've got chicken and whatever's in your batter, some flour, and then whatever you're using to hold it together and some seasoning. I don't remember the number, but I know it was over 20. Wow. Ingredients in a chicken nugget. And it was just like, 
Now, does that mean that I've made all of the lifestyle changes that I should so that I'm not eating chicken nuggets and I'm going home and making real food? No, when I talk about my book, she'll find out that cooking is not my thing. But <laughs> um, but it is really eye-opening when you look at that and go, yeah, that's not really food. It's not really nourishing my body, even though it might taste good. So thank you for sharing. Um, let's have Kelly go next with your books with memorable food. So I couldn't have been more excited about this topic. And there were so many books that I could have picked, but um, I picked two um, cookbooks per se um, to focus on. And one, the first one that I'll start with is um, Tiny Food Party. And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tiny Kitchen, um, but it's this phenomenon um, from Taste Made, and they make um, itty bitty, teeny tiny food. Like, so they take regular food and they make it teeny tiny size, which sounds absurd and ridiculous, and it is, but it's so great to watch, and I'm obsessed with it. Um, they do things like uh, apple pie, um, lasagna, they've done KFC, they've done Happy Meals, like the lasagna and the apple pie are my favorite because they're just so intricate. Um, so when I saw a tiny food party, I was like, what? I can make tiny food at my house? I'm not going to, but it was still <laughs> fun to know that I couldn't have the option. So um, this book is more of like tiny appetizers, which is still fun. Um, but some of the tiny food that I really enjoyed in this one was the um, one by onion rings when they used shallots, like slices of shallots. I don't know if you can see that. So little baby onion rings. Thank you. And then um, I also enjoyed the chicken and waffles. Oh. Little baby waffles with little chickens on them. And my all time favorite, Mini Pop Tarts. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cute. Oh, and, again. This, and these are like real food. This isn't like food yeah. made out of polymer clay or something. This is they're really baking little bitty food. This is legit little baby food. And like I said, this book is aimed more towards um, tiny food appetizers, you know, like um, for entertaining. Uh, but the tiny kitchen is like legit real food, just tiny versions. Like they use quail eggs instead of hen eggs. And like, I mean, it's absurd and amazing. Um, I'm, I can cook good, but I can't bake very well. Um, and I'm gonna chalk up mini food into that category too. I don't think I have the patience to do mini food, but I enjoy looking at the mini food and knowing that that's an option one day. So <laughs> tiny food by uh, Tiny Food Party by Terry Lynn Fisher and Jenny Park. It's uh, a fun, fun one to look at. Oh, yeah. Now, let me tell you about this next book. I wanna live in this book. So I found this book on our shelf at South Rockwood and I was like, oh, wow, I um, the cover on here that you guys are seeing on this on the on the um, slide is the paperback and this is the hardcover. The hardcover is absolutely gorgeous. And I was like, oh, what's this? And what's do what, what's this in the cookbook section? Um, these girls are like my new like I want to be best friends with them. Um, they're from the UK um, and they're two friends that met at a um, jumble sale, which I just love, I love their words for everything. A jumbo sale is a rummage sale. Didn't know that. Um, you know, both wearing their bum bags, which are fanny packs. <laughs> I love it. It gets better, you guys. So these two friends uh, are both starting their careers in radio and TV when they meet. And after talking, it was clear that their common ground was food. Buying it, cooking it, eating it. Um, and hosting was also a mutual passion. So after a few months of meeting and um, setting themselves or cooking for themselves like every other week, um, they decided to set up a challenge for themselves and open their doors to their house to cook for other people, but not just friends, strangers. So they decided to do a supper club. This is how a supper club was born. And um, I love entertaining. Like that's one of the best parts of food for me is eating it with people, right? It's such a... Um, it's it's such a personal experience when you're eating food with people. Um, I love to be the host of an entertainment party with food, right? So right away I was like, supper club, yes, this is my gig. So um, even though they didn't know what it was and they kind of made up the rules, they decided to, the first rule would be invite as many people as they had chairs, which was 16. The second was to set a mood and then three was to embrace all the friendships that would be made. They said the first supper club they had, um, you know, had its trials and errors, but they, it was great. Um, friendships were made, people left with new phone numbers in their phone. And I was like, that's like a dream come true. Um, so four years later, they've learned a lot and they know the cheats, the shortcuts and the tips of what it takes to make hosting breezy. So they decided to put all of their 
um, some ideas into this book. So this book is 25 menus and um, it tells you uh, or 24 occasions that you can do to have a dinner or supper club, um, how to set the mood, how to make the most of your space and taking the stress out of entertaining. Um, so if you're racking your brain on how to um, give a full spread for six friends on a Wednesday night, this book will help you. It sets it up um, themes um, and then it has all the menus, drinks, desserts, mooding, mood um, and everything. It's awesome. Um, so because entertaining should be fun, not meant to be dwelled on too much. And my favorite quote in this is it's only dinner after all. There's no point in crying over spilt milk. Never mind burnt lemon tarts. <laughs> so I wanted to show you some of the um, ones that they had in here. So they do a Mexican spread. Yeah. Um, and then like, look at, I mean, could I just live in this book? I mean, <laughs> oh. food and the setting and the food is just gorgeous. They had a DIY tie night in there that you can do. I just, so if anybody wants any, um, oh, they did a movie night too. Like how fun is that? with brownies and different snacks and stuff. Um, so if anyone wants any ideas for my birthday in August, I'd really like to own this book. <laughs> I was like, we're never going to get that book back at the library, are we? I was like, oh, I should just keep checking this out. But you know, my birthday's right around the corner. So if anyone's looking for any ideas, you can get it. Round to Ours is what that, that book is called. I'm so excited I forgot to tell the title of it. Round to Ours um, by Alice Jackson, or I'm sorry, Laura Jackson and Alice Levine. So check it out. It's awesome. <laughs> I was going to ask when the first party is that you're throwing, but it looks like we're throwing one for you. So <laughs> that'd be great. OK, <laughs> no, you know, I like parties that I'm the center of attention. To. Sure thing. <laughs> so I have to ask, it's a British cookbook, right? Because yes. they're, they're British. Do they have the measurements in the American measurements or are they all in like the liters and the grams? They have a nifty chart that comes with it. Oh, Conversions. Conversions. <laughs> Yeah, right, right in the inside of it with this little pocket. Oh, nice. I thought you ripped so that gorgeous. page out of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Jody was like getting eyes out of your head, didn't they, Jody? What? <laughs> no, oh, conveniently, we have to weed it now. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> How fun! Although I have to say, it's good that. There are all sorts of people in the world because cooking and throwing a dinner party sounds like a nightmare that I would have at night where it'd be like, hey, Jennifer, you want to throw a dinner party for 16 people and cook it and and host it and make sure everybody feels welcome and comfortable? Like, yeah, that's my husband. No. That's like, that's like my nightmare. I'm with you, Jennifer. Nightmare I, I would sitting. go to your dinner party and quietly enjoy my food and talk to my neighbors and probably have a lovely time, but. Yeah, that's yeah. my husband. This COVID is cramping my style because that's my, that's my husband right there. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Kelly. Tiny food and amazing dinner parties. Thank you. You're welcome. And, we, and Jody. What are your books with memorable food? I picked a couple of books um, that we had. First of all, one of them that was an author that I had talked about before. Um, Mark Kurlansky was an author read we had done in my Just the Facts nonfiction book club that we have at Bedford. And so he had done a book. One of the ones that I had read of his is called The Food of a Younger Land. And so this kind of ties into the Dorito effect and what you guys were saying about how food isn't real food um, anymore. And I found this book really fascinating. So um, this is kind of some most of this is from the blurb about the book, but while Kurlansky was researching the big oyster, one of the other titles he wrote in the Library of Congress, he stumbled across the archives for the American Eats Project and discovered the wonderful window into our national past. In the 1930s, with the country in the grip of the Great Depression and millions of Americans struggling to get by, Franklin D. Roosevelt created the Federal Writers Project under the New Deal to give work to artists and writers such as John Cheever and Richard Wright. 
So a number of writers, including Zora Neale Hurston, Eudora Welty, and Nelson Algren, were dispatched all across America to chronicle the eating habits, traditions, and struggles of local people. The project was abandoned in the early 1940s and never completed. Before the national highway system brought the country closer together, before chain restaurants brought uniformity, and before the refrigerator meant that frozen food could be stored for longer, the nation's food was seasonal, regional, and traditional. It helped to, to, to form the distinct character, attitudes, and customs of those who ate it. And I thought that was just a fascinating, it was really, fa you know, it, it's broken down into regional sections. So you can check out a regional section and find all the things that were um, part of that heritage. Uh, and lots and lots of great recipes included in there. And again, all of that research was done in the 30s. So Kurlansky took that research, used that exact, you know, that exact writing, that exact research, those exact recipes, but then he put his own twist into it as well to make it a enjoyable, readable book. So um, I found that one really fascinating. And for anybody who likes to travel, you know, you can stop it you can stop at an Applebee's or a Cracker Barrel or a McDonald's anywhere that you want, but if you really want to get into what that region is about, you have to find the little, like the little barbecue in Virginia, for instance. So, um, you you know, it's it, it was interesting anyway. And then the other one um, is called Books That Cook, and this one is um, edited by Jennifer Cagnard Black and Melissa Goldthwaite. Um, I will be honest and say I didn't finish reading this book yet, but we're doing this book for my book club um, coming up here pretty soon. And it was recommended by one of the members in my book club. Um, and so it's a compilation of, um, it's organized kind of like a cookbook. Um, it says it's the making of a literary meal. It's a collection of American literature written on the theme of food. Each section begins with an excerpt from an influential American cookbook, progressing chronologically from the late 1700s through present day, including such favorites as American cookery, the joy of cooking, and mastering the art of French cooking. And the literary works in each section are an extension of those cookbooks. Um, while in turn the cookbook excerpts become a literature form of their own. So it has, uh, each section has an assortment of poetry, prose, and essays, and all the selections include at least one recipe to entice readers to cook this book. It includes writing from such notables as Maya Angelou, James Beard, Alice B. Toklas, Sherman Alexi, Nora Ephron, M. F. K. Fisher, and Alice Waters, among many others. Uh, Books That Cook reveals the range of ways authors incorporate recipes, whether the recipe flavors the story or the story serves to add spice to the recipe. So it's kind of a double, double, you know, what, what a cookbook is and what that means to authors and what authors mean to cookbooks. So it's, it was just an interesting, it's an interesting read. I've often thought when you talked about your first one, I often thought that if I, it would do me very, you know, it would do wonders for myself or my diet or my weight if I had to literally cook everything like they used to. If I had to, you know, slaughter the chicken, pluck it, boil it, you know, and you couldn't just pick something up. I feel like that would be good for me to try because I I wouldn't want to do all that work. You know, I like to just open a bag of chips or whatever. And so I feel like if I had to go back to that way, I feel no wonder everyone was so skinny. You know, it was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> they were working for their meals. It was, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of work. Yeah. Know, and less feel, food. You know, everything yes, was yeah. less and less calories and, and less convenient. Oh, yeah. Calories, too. Yeah. I feel like I should try that, but you know I won't. <laughs> Don't you feel like too when you make a big meal and you put all this effort into it, like it's time to eat it, and then you're like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> like, you're because you're like, exhausted. You're exhausted. I, when I make a meal, I'm like, me, I'll take like a little bowl. But if someone else makes a meal, I'm like, so, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that. I don't, I don't know how that correlates, but I know if I had to cook like that and pluck and every, no, I'd, I'd probably be super skinny too. <laughs> and I. Yeah. I'm sure I'd eat fewer meals. Like that's the other thing, you know, like I could eat all day long, but I know, if... but you probably try for like one a day or even every other day. Cause man, I just, I just slaughtered that chicken yesterday. I'm not having chicken for a month, you know, and then it's like twigs and berries tonight, everyone. I mean, I... <laughs> well, well, you mind so... when you... go ahead, Mandy. I was just saying, even with our vegetable garden, you know, like a tomato does not taste so good from the store as it does coming out of your own garden. 
Um, and part of it's the work that you've put into it. And so you're actually reaping the reward yourself. Um, but part of it is just that like it's just the way it's intended to be like straight from the garden into your house. Um, and there's just nothing better. I have a real hard time buying tomatoes off season. That's for sure. I got some yesterday at a store right down the road from me that look like actual garden, you know, look, feel, smell like actual garden tomatoes. So I was so excited. I got millions of tomatoes on my plants, but they're still green. So Our, yeah. ours are turned. We've already got some. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I've gotten some great some tomatoes, awesome. yeah. no, but our big ones tomatoes. haven't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ones we're growing out here at the library, we've got a little tiny plot behind on the lower level of our Dundee library, and we have three tomato plants, and one is really thriving, and the other two are sort of growing, but I don't know if they're going to make it. And then our new youth services person, Ms. Karina, planted all sorts of stuff out there. And um, so I've been taking pictures every day so I can put them all together at the end of the season so you can see how they've grown over time. Um, so I think that's really neat. One of the, I think it was an NPR story maybe, they were talking about the fact that apart from losing the nutrition because you're preparing your own food, you also lose that sense of connection and gratitude because, you know, I just go into Kroger and grab my meat or grab my vegetables. So even if they're healthy, I'm not thinking about how did this food get here? How was it grown? Who worked on this food? Um, and I thought that was a really interesting perspective apart from the health, but that connection to community as well. Um, and talking about the preparation of food also made me think of Greenfield Village. They have that farm there and they do the food demonstration and they always do it for lunch because they're using the food from their farm that is available to them that day and preparing a meal. And it's the big meal of the day for the people who are there working on the farm that day, working with the animals or harvesting the food or planting or whatever they're doing. And that was really interesting. But the women who were making the meal like I think I don't remember what they had when we went but one of the things was biscuits and they started cooking at like 6 a.m they were putting everything together or they were letting the bread rise and yeah it's a lot of work yeah so now I'm going to talk about my books and explain why yeah I would have a hard time with that <laughs> so thank you Jody. and so my first book is you suck at cooking. So first of all, the title itself just really caught my eye when I saw it on the library shelf. So I had to pick it up. The subtitle is the absurdly practical guide to sucking slightly less at making food. And the author never gives his or her name, um, but there is apparently a YouTube channel called You Suck at Cooking, which I have not gone and checked out. I have only looked at the book. So I can't tell you whether it's awesome as the book is or not. But first of all, the book is super tongue in cheek, but it is also a cookbook. But there is humor packed on every page. So first of all, in the intro, it says, if you bring this book home, you'll learn to cook with unintimidating ingredients in dishes like broccoli cheddar quiche cupcake muffin type things. Eddie's roasted red pepper dip, while also learning all about Eddie's sad, sad life. Jalapeno chicken, and also other stuff. In addition, there are cooking tips that can be applied not only to the very recipes in this book, but also to recipes outside of this book, and to all other areas of your life, with mixed results. In the end, you might suck slightly less at cooking. Asterisk, results are not guaranteed. No, no, they're not guaranteed. <laughs> um, so there's a whole list of things that you might need. You might need taste buds. You're going to need a heat source, suggested heat sources. Fire, which is described as yellowish, orangish, pointyish, shape sifting, gas like substance. You could also possibly use the sun. That's a heat source. And they describe that. Also, there's a stove, which they refer to as the kitchen hot box. It's inside your kitchen and it gets hot. So <laughs> be aware of that. Um, so there's just all sorts of really, really funny things in here. Um, 
so they also say how to cook almost anything. Cooking anything method number one is roasting. Cooking anything method number two is pan frying. Cooking anything method number three is my personal favorite and why I need to hang out more with Marsha and Kelly is mooching. Go over to a friend's house and see what food they have lying around. Make remarks such as, boy, I bet that would be tasty if somebody cooked that thing. Or I'd hate to have to end our friendship on account of you not cooking that thing that would be tasty if you cooked it and therefore make us better friends. <laughs> Continue making remarks as needed until you are enjoying a delicious meal. Transcend any negative scowl energy that is directed at you. So yeah, the whole book is like that. There are actually recipes in here. All the recipes have comments. This one is, I'm not going to turn around because you won't be able to see it, but this one is for pan fried kale. Kale, yes. So at the bottom, there's a note on the recipe. So if you're struggling, the lemon juice is especially important in this dish because it balances out the bitterness of the kale. The bitterness of the kale is due to its smug and condescending nature. Attempts to breed the smugness out of kale resulted in kale that was so happy it was nauseating. So the farmers bred the smugness back in. If the lemon juice doesn't calm down the bitterness enough for your taste, then it's best only to eat pan fried kale when you're in love and you won't notice the taste. <laughs> so all, uh, all of the comments in here are hysterical. And I would love to tell you that I ran out and started trying these recipes and discovered, hey, I can cook. I did not. <laughs> I, I can bake and I love to bake. But cooking to me is trying to put together a puzzle. I don't know how to do the pieces. Like some people are like, listen, I got a piece of pork over here and I got a squash and a kumquat. Here, let me mix this into a delicious meal. And it's amazing. And me, I'm like, here's your raw kumquat. Um, I can probably microwave the squash, maybe. I don't know, I'll put some butter on that. And pork, um, I can probably put that in a frying pan for you, maybe. <laughs> It might not burn. Not a cook. So anyways, but this book made me laugh and laugh and laugh. So check that one out. My other book is King Bidgoods in the Bathtub, and it is a children's book, and it's one that we read to Tony over and over and over again to the point where my husband and I both had it memorized when he was little. And there's a definite rhythm to the book, or at least there was when we read it. I don't know if that was intentional. But when you start it, it's, so King Bidgood's in the bathtub and he won't get out. He's going to stay in there all day. And the book follows King Bidgood being in the bathtub from sunrise until midnight. And everybody tries to get poor King Bidgood out of the bathtub with various methods to no avail. He just invites them into his bathtub and whatever it is that they think they should be doing, they're going to do there in the bathtub. So the rhythm is, Help, help, cried the page when the sun came up. King Bigod's in the bathtub and he won't get out. Oh, who knows what to do? I do, cried the knight when the sun came up. Get out, it's time to battle. Come in, cried the king with a boom, boom, boom. Today we'll battle in the tub. So all the different people in the kingdom are trying to get the king out of the tub. And one of them is the queen who suggests they could go eat lunch. And this is them eating lunch in the tub. It's like a dream come true. You can have a bubble bath, you can have your roasted chicken, and just the detail, like that cake with the king in his castle, in his tub, topped with a rainbow. I mean, come on. And I remember sitting with Tony and we'd stop on this page and talk about, okay, if you could only pick one item from this page that you needed to eat, what would you pick? And I usually wanted to eat one of those tiny little sheep <laughs> that are there. And Tony usually picked the cake that's in the background back there because, you know, he was like three or four, so he's picking normal things. So that's King Big Goods in the Bathtub. And if you haven't checked it out, even if you don't have kids, you know, the illustrations are amazing. It was a Caldecott honor book, and the Caldecott is an award given by the American Library Association for best illustrations, and it was an honor book. So, you know, if you suck at cooking, 
just go check out King Bidgood. You know, he's he's got it going on over there in the kingdom. So, so those are my books with memorable food. So thank you to everybody for contributing and sharing your books with us again this week. Next week, we are sharing our best beach reads. So it's right smack dab in the middle of summer. So maybe you're getting outside and find, need something to read that's going to keep your attention on a sunny day near a lake. So we'll be talking about our best beach reads. Um, thank you for listening again. Thank you again to all of the amazing Monroe County Library System librarians and staff who participated. And hopefully you'll listen again next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.